everybody. And uh, thank you so much for reading that, Jonathan. We're going to be in continuing in Romans. Uh, we're going to be camping out in the book of Romans for a while. And so we're going to be in Romans chapter 2 today. And uh, as, as this, this title card says here, Letter to the Romans, Discovering the Foundations of Our Faith. That's, that's what this is. And so last week, last week was a little rough. We had the really wonderful introduction and and Paul was saying, hey, I, I've just been praying for you. I continue to pray for you. Your faith is, has reached my ears all the way over here. And, and uh, this is such an awesome thing, but I want to be able to come and, and share something with you. And, and so today we're going to be in chapter 2. And the, you know, the, the first one, we had the sort of the, the judgment on the Gentiles. And we looked at what was going on in the culture, and we sort of saw a stair step down. As people denied God, they said, I, I, we see, we see your, your miracles, we see your wonders, we know you're here, but we don't want anything to do with you. And so we see a stair step down, stair step down, stair step down, and we sort of see what the end result was with that. But then we have, we have the, the second piece here, because, you know, the thing of it is, is, is we had the, the Jews and the Gentiles, and, and the Jews sort of had this idea, well, we're God's people, so we're exempt from all this stuff. And we're going to be looking in chapter 2 that there is no exemption. No exemption. And so as we look at this, this is going to be a, a really important thing to know. Now, now, have you ever seen a situation like this? Somebody wants to judge someone else. And, uh, you know, we, we, we get all these, you know, fingers pointing. Now, I'm going to tell you something that, you know, I was told when I was a kid. When you point your finger, there's three of them pointing back at you. <laughs> You know, that's kind of the point here, and so I hope that you'll see this, and so that's what our background picture is today, is, is as they're trying to make judgment on this lady, you know, I don't know what, you're not holding your baby right, you're not feeding them right, you're not doing the, I, I've heard it all, but you know, with, the funny thing is, is when we try to accuse other people, it seems like sometimes we're the ones that need to be accused ourselves. So as we go, I, I want us to think back, we're still in the courtroom, Chapter 1, 2, and 3, I, I want you to keep your head in the courtroom. And, and so we're going to have a little pause since I'm not going to be here for Mother's Day. Uh, there's going to be a little bit of a pause. And so um, I want you to remember, and we're going to stay in the courtroom. So we had the, the, the prosecution sort of brought the, the uh, case against the Gentiles. The prosecution's going to bring the case against the Jews as well this week. And then... Week three, when we get to Romans chapter three, we're going to see the defense is going to stand and it's going to be beautiful. And so I, I, I want you to hold on. So if you're going, man, the first two chapters are really depressing. I want you to hold on to chapter three because it gets better. But we need to understand we need to have that that vision of ourselves in the mirror. So we don't have this this haughty view of ourselves. So we don't get this this, you know, well, I'm a Christian. I've got this all figured out. Because that's, that's, that's what the world likes to accuse us of, isn't it? They like to say, oh, you, you, you guys think you're so be much better than us. We're not. We're not. You know, I've heard so many people say, well, I don't want to go to church. There's hypocrites there. You know what? This is a hospital. This is where sick people go. People with broken arms, broken legs, broken spirits. This is where God comes to heal people. And so if you're expecting people to be all, do you go to the, the hospital and you expect to see marathon runners and all this sort of stuff running down the hall? No. You expect to see sick people, right? So when you go to church, don't expect to see people that's got it all figured out because we don't. This is where we go to hear from the Lord to heal us, that we can improve our lives, that we can become better. That's what church is about. And so when you get mad at each other, you know, we get mad at each other. We, we we're human, right? We get frustrated with each other. Understand we're, we're broken. But that Lord is, is hopefully working in our lives that we're getting better. So, oh my. <laughs> what a way to start this, right? Jerry Springer. Um, you know, some of you who might be my age or maybe a little bit older probably know who this guy is. You know, he, did you know he passed away this past week? Um, and so Jerry Springer passed away. Uh, he happened to have a TV show. Now, now, I lived in Cincinnati for a while. And Jerry Springer has a little bit more to do with Cincinnati than some places because I believe he was in office there at some point in time or something like that uh, <laughs> before my day. But uh, that being said, he was he was this host of this show, and it was for the time it was the grungiest show on TV. Right? You don't have to t you don't have to raise your hands if you watch Jerry Springer. I don't want to know. <laughs> 
But the whole purpose why that show was so popular is he would bring in these people that had all sorts of issues, all sorts. Of, and, you know, you could feel better about yourself. I'm, at least I'm not doing what they're doing. But, you know, that, that's a problem, isn't it? When we get this vi- vision that we, we want to look at other people and say, I'm not as bad as that person. I'm doing better than they are. The problem is, is you may think that you're doing better, but it doesn't mean that you're, you're in the right. You know, that's the problem is when we decide that we're going to compare our lives against someone else, you know, I don't struggle with that sin. I'm better than they are. No. Do you realize when God looks at us, when he looks at sin, sin is sin is sin. All sin. It says for the wages of sin is death. It doesn't say for the wages of lying is death. It doesn't say for the wages of homosexuality is death. It doesn't say for the wages of uh, pride is death says for the wages of sin is death so whether you have the the sin of a white lie whether you have the sin of gossip whether you have the sin of envy whether you have the sin of lying whether you have the sin of foul language it doesn't matter sin is sin and so don't fall into the trap of well i'm better than they are you know that might make for entertainment in our world today but that doesn't mean that that's right or it's something that you should use in your life you know, the other thing is, is we sort of learned last week that it doesn't matter if you haven't heard, you know, God has revealed himself in creation. If you willingly ignore him, you're still going to be held responsible. There's no getting out of things just because, oh, I didn't know. I, you know, nobody told me. God's screaming that there's a creator, that, that he's there. But people want to ignore it. You know, that's what we learned out last week when, when people saw that God's creation, they saw his invisible attributes, and yet they ignored it. I want nothing to do with it. And they turned their heads, and they, they dug their heads in the sand, and they came up with their own thoughts and ideas and their own gods and their own reason why we're here. Do you realize, I mean, here, here's, here's the world we live in. Here's, here's all the hope and joy you have. You either are listening to, it's either way God says it is, which is the truth, or you believe in some other God or something like that. Or, hey, you believe in the, 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 the religion of evolution and science, and, well, you're just highly evolved pond scum. Congratulations. Boy, that's really hopeful, isn't it? You know, we, we wonder, people go, you know, why is there so much evil in the world? Well, if you're just highly evolved pond scum, what does it matter? I mean, seriously. You know, people get all, you know, oh, we see all this evil and we need to... But yet they want to, the reason why we have morality, the, it, it, the God's law is written on people's hearts, which we're going to look at here in just a little bit. They want to ignore all that. No, you can be good without God. That's, that's what the, the, the atheists like to have. They have their little good without God campaign. You wonder why there's so much evil. It's because people are ignoring God. But then again, there's also, we're going to see today that, you don't get to have diplomatic community. I'm, I'm of the people of God. You know, we, we live in a time where it seems like whatever community you're aligned with, you know, you want to take on their identity and, and all the, the benefits and all this sort of stuff. You know, we, we've, we've kind of sort of come to a place where it, it's, you know, oh, if you're the right political affici- uh, affiliation, you're, you're good with us or, or this that, or whatever. It doesn't matter. There is no diplomatic community with God. And when we, I want you to see this we, with his own people, the people that he chose to bear his name, the people that he chose to be his people. They are still going to be held liable for their sin. And so if God holds his people rely, uh, liable for their sin, don't you think he's going to hold us liable? So there is no diplomatic immunity. There is no get out of hell free card just because of who you are or what group you aff- uh, associate with. It that doesn't happen. So let's go ahead and see what God's word has to say to us. Turn with me to Romans chapter 2, starting in verse 1. What a way to start. Therefore, you are inexcusable, O man, whoever you are who judge. for For if what you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge practice the same things. But we know that the judgment of God is according to truth, against those who practice such things. And do you think this, O man, you who judge, who practice such things, and doing the same, that you will escape the judgment of God? 
Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? But in accordance with your hardness and your impertinent heart, you are treasuring up for yourselves wrath in the day of wrath and, and uh, revelation of the righteous uh, judgment of God, who will render to each one according to his deeds. So we, we see, you know, we are inexcusable. You know, we, we, want, we want to sit in judgment of people, and, and, you know, that's the bad thing, is the church is, a, is accused right now of sitting in judgment. Oh, you just hate this group, and you hate this group. And you, no! If you, if you are a Christian here today, and you hate a certain group of people, I'm asking you, stop, repent. This is not what we're called to do. We are sinners. We're all sinners. You may not struggle with one point, but you struggle with something else. And guess what? When we sit in judgment over somebody and we say, well, you can't, you're not worthwhile. You can't be saved. No one can. Do you realize we're pouring that same judgment on us? That is, that is scary stuff, people. Because God is the only judge. Now, we, remember, we set up the courtroom last week. We said, God is the judge. He's the guy sitting on the, the, the lectern. He's the guy that's up there on the judgment bench. But we have, the wonderful thing is, is that Jesus is sitting as defense attorney, if you know him as your Lord and Savior. But the scary thing is, the terrifying thing is, is if you do not know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, the only one sitting at the defendant bench is you. And that's a scary thought. You know, he says when we, when we judge others, we're practicing judgment, that we're storing up wrath for ourselves. That is terrifying. You know, I, I tell people, you know, God is not, you know, uh, sitting up there like they thought, you know, Zeus, you know, with lightning bolts to pick people off. But the thing of it is, is, is that God is a God of justice. And if we, we want to hold on to, we just hold on to our sins and stuff, there is going to be a day we're going to be judged for them. And it is going to be righteous and deserved justice. If that doesn't shake you to your very core, I don't know what will. You know, we, we can believe the, the illusion, oh, it, that's not the way it is, that's not this, that's not. It, it, it's a little scary to be putting on, well, I, I don't think that's the way it is. Because if it is, that should be terrifying to us. But I want you to see this little quote I have here. It says, people are often guilty of the very things they accuse others of doing and don't even know it. Find your blind spots. You know, we go, oh, I can't believe they said that about that person, but yet you, you're the one that has to know the scoop about everything and everybody. You know, th this, is the, this is the thing. Do you realize, as pastor, I hear all sorts of things. But I hope you know, and I hope that, that you you've understand that when, you, when I hear things, it dies with me. Okay? That, that's, that's, but that, that's, that's rough stuff. You know, well, what's going on? I can't tell you that. I'm sorry. But I want to know. Nope, sorry. You know, we, we've got we to check ourselves because the very thing that we, someone else struggles with, the thing that we're pointing at them, because, you know, when we go, well, they're, they're putting other things in front of God in their life. Well, are you putting something in front of God in your life? You know, when, oh, they're struggling with this sexual sin. Guess what? You know what sexual sin is called? Sexual immorality. Do you want to know what that includes? everything, all of it. So just because somebody's struggling with this point, don't, they'll go, oh, you know, because you might be struggling with some other part of that. And guess what? You're both guilty. Let's keep going. Verse 7 says, eternal life to those who repent or who are patient, cont uh, continuance in doing good, seeking for, uh, seek for glory, honor, and immortality, but to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, they uh, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath. Tribulation and anguish on every soul of man who does evil, of the Jew first and also of the Greek. But glory, honor, and peace to everyone who works what is good, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for there is no partiality with God. So what is this saying here? He says, the, remember, we, we left with God is going to render each one according to his deeds. You know, eternal life to those who are patient, continuance in doing good work, seeking for glory, honor, and immortality. You know, those that are doing good, God's going to reward with good. And those that are doing evil, God's going to reward with evil. 
but this leaves us a couple of things. One, I want you to see something here. It says, first to the Jew and then to the Greek. There's no partiality. There isn't any, oh, I'm, I'm part of God's team. I'm one of God's chosen people. I don't get the punishment. No. Punishment comes to the Jew first and then to the Greek. The good, good comes to the Jew first and then to the, it, it goes to everybody. But this leaves us a question, right? We, we can see this, characterizing God's judgments. God sees and knows all things. Yep, it's truth. If you think you're hiding something from God, whoops, you're, you're making a mistake. He sees everything. He knows everything. You may not be honest with God, but he knows it. You may not admit to it, but he knows it. God weighs human actions in the balances of justice. This is true. Third thing, God rewards good and punishes the bad. Now, now this, this is true, but we, we go, but does that, mean, does that mean that good works save us? Nope. It's not good works that save us. How, are we, how do we come to know the Lord is our Lord and Savior? What, what, is, what forgives us? For by grace are we saved through faith. Right? Not of works of righteousness. Now, now, I want you to see this. We don't do good works to be saved. We do good works because we are saved. So, so th there's no earning your way to heaven. You know, well, my good's going to outweigh my bad. No. Our bad is, is, is an impossibly heavy weight that cannot be overcome by ourselves. Only by the perfect blood of Jesus can that, that weight be tipped back into the balance. That, that, that God sees his blood of his son and he says, you're forgiven. But he saves us to do good works. And so if you think, oh, my, you know, I'm, I'm saved. I've, I've prayed the prayer. I've done the stuff. And then you live like the devil. There, there's something wrong. You need to check yourself because we are not saved as a get out of hell free card. We're not saved as fire insurance policy. We're saved to do good works. We're, our, we're saved so we can do the will of God in this world, that we can be an example, that people can see the love of Jesus. And so we see that, yes, there is these rewards for those that are looking for God, those that are seeking truth, that are doing good things, that, that we see that there's going to be sal uh, salvation, immortality, there's going to be uh, eternal life. Those who are self-seeking, you do not obey truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath, tribulation, and anguish on every soul of man who does evil. So it's not, not the works themselves, but God is going to judge. He is going to reward. You know, there is two judgments in the Bible. There is the one that we think of in Revelation, the great white throne judgment, where the books are opened and all this sort of stuff. As I read the Bible, if you're a Christian, I don't believe we go there. That is, that is the judgment for, for those that have not chosen God. And they will see God in all of his majesty. They will have all their things. And God will say, how do you plead? What do you say for yourself? And the people will be silent before God because they will have nothing to say. Christians, however, we're in front of Jesus. We're in the judgment seat of Jesus. And all of our works, everything we did is going to be put in front of Jesus and it's going to be tested by fire. The things that we did for ourselves, the things that we did for our own wants and our own desires are going to be burned up. The things that we did for God and for his glory is going to come out the other side as precious stones and gems and gold and, and all that wonderful stuff. The question is going to be and says that there is going to be some that, that go into heaven and they are going to smell of smoke. Because everything they did in their life was for themselves. You know, I've always wondered, it says, you know, there's going to be some in heaven that smell of smoke. I, you know, I've always wondered about this. This is one of those big, you know, uh, you know, we don't have a theological thing to be able to say about this. But it doesn't say when that smell of smoke ends. You might smell of smoke for all eternity as a testament to God's grace. <laughs> oh, they're smoky. God's good, isn't he? Yeah, buddy, he is. <laughs> I mean, you know, that, that, may be, that may be. But guess what? It's better to be the janitor in heaven than the king of hell. But, but do you really want to ha spend eternity smelling of smoke? When we can do things for the Lord, when we can do the good works that he saved us for? Let's keep going. Verse 12. For as many have sinned without law will also perish without law, 
As many have sinned in the law will be judged by the law. For not the hearers of the law are just in the sight of God, but the doers of the law will be justified. For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do things in the law, these, although they not having the law, are a law to themselves, who show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and between themselves and their thoughts accusing or else excusing them. In the day when God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. So when, wait, what is this saying here? What is this saying? It's saying that God's law is written on people's hearts. You know, your conscience, you know, understanding what's right and wrong, you know, morality. You know where that comes from? It does not come from, I can be good without God, as the atheist said. No, it comes from God himself. He writes on people's hearts. And he's saying having the law isn't going to save anybody. You know, the Jews that said, but we were of the children of Moses, and we, 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 were, we were children of Abraham, and we, we did all this stuff, and, and we, were, we were the people of the law. But did you follow it? Well, no, but we had it, and it was given to us, and this is our birthright. Nope. Sorry, no excuse. No excuses. There is no, I have my Jew card. Nope. Sorry, it's, it's not like Sam's Club. It's not like Costco. You can't show your card and get in. Eh, wrong. It's by the blood of Jesus. But it says that the Gentiles who have no law, but they do the things of the law, are a law unto themselves. You know, the thing of it is, is, is the fact that, that, that people have a conscience and they know what's right and wrong, that is, that is a testament to God is there. You know, they, they like to say we're animals, right? They like to say, oh, you're, we're, just, we're just animals. We're just doing whatever we want to do. Have you ever seen what animals do to each other? I mean, have you ever? You know, they fight and they, they, they kill and they slaughter. They, they do whatever. You know, when we, when we look and we see a shooting in Texas, when we see a mass shooting and people are, oh, that's horrible. If you're an animal, no, it isn't. It's just an animal being an animal. But people naturally know that people are something different. Why? Because God wrote it on their heart. But yet they won't, they won't yield to that. They can't handle, they can't stand that they're responsible to God. And it, it just it makes them angry and mad. You know, it, it's, I, I've seen so many debates and stuff on, on YouTube and as I'm preparing for sermons and stuff, and people are, you know, well, I just, and they're just angry. And hateful. You know, I seen this one lady who this guy, he's he's a he's an open air preacher and he's he's telling people and he's saying, you know, yes, we're all sinners, but God loves you. And he died for you. And she goes up and says, Well, I just don't think this is the way it needs to be done, and this, that, and whatever. And he says, Do you want me to tell them that they're not sinners, that they're they're not under God's God's judgment at the moment? Because because they are. I mean, I'm not helping them, I'm not telling them, I'm not. It may sound nicer, but is it really love when you tell somebody who's about to walk off? Oh, it looks like smooth sailing ahead for you. I mean, we can we can smile and wave and say, you just go on. But is that truly love? You know, I, we were talking earlier this morning in, in a, a thing that happened when I was in Cincinnati came to mind. And it, it really kind of bothered me. I really hate injuring my kids. I've had to do it a couple times. When, when Lucas had his surgery, they were working on his head. He was just four months old. You know, they had to get blood from him, and they had to do it from his feet because he was so small. And they had me, I had to hold him down, and he was squirming, and it was hurting him, and I knew it was hurting him. And when I let go of him, I saw bruises where my fingers were on him. I bawled. When Gracie was real little, we were out visiting my in-laws, and I was looking at the tires and something. There was something wrong with the wheel, and I was looking at it. And Gracie toddled right behind me, and, and where my, my in-laws lived is one of the busiest roads in all of, of Cincinnati. And it has a blind curve, and people go like 70 miles an hour around this curve, and you don't see what's on the other side. And Gracie was walking. I seen her. I just I felt her right behind me, and she was. I seen her, and I, I heard the sound, because there's a weird sound that you hear because the, the way the wind works and stuff, you can hear when a car's coming. And my hand came around, and I hit Gracie and went, and she started bawling. 
in their car. I about lost my cookies, but then when we, when we took her in the house, there was a handprint on her chest. It broke my heart. But I also know that if God hadn't let me know that she was there, she would have got run over and I would not have my daughter. Sometimes what God tells us hurts. It's difficult. But he's a, he's a loving father who's, who's putting his hand out and saying, no, you're running off a cliff. Stop. Let's keep going. Verse 17. Indeed, you who are called Jew, uh, called a Jew and rest on the law and make your boast in God and know his will and approve the things that are excellent being instructed out of the law and are confident that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in the darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, having the form of knowledge and truth in the law. You, therefore, who teach one another, do you not teach yourself? You who preach that a man should not steal, do you steal? You say, do not commit adultery. Do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you, do you ro uh, rob temples? You who make your boast in the law, do you dishonor God through breaking the law? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you, as it is written. Do you see, you know, he's talking to the Jews. He's saying, you, you boast, we have the law. We know God's will. We know what God wants. And he's saying, but do you not teach yourselves? You're sitting here and judging everybody else and you're pointing the fingers. But do you do the same things? You know, think about, think about the Pharisees. You know, these, these people, remember what Jesus told them. He says, do what they tell you. Just don't do what they do. Because they were telling the people the right thing. They were telling the people the truth. They were teaching the people the law. But then they wanted to bend the law to their own whims and desires. They sat in judgment of everybody. They, they, all they cared about was their power and their authority and their prestige. And people going, Rabbi, teacher, teacher, you know. Do we want people to look at us and, and just give us praise and heap things on us, you know, all this sort of stuff? You know, there, there is a reason. There's a reason why when I introduce myself, I introduce myself as Tim. I don't introduce myself as pastor. Because I am a man just the same as anyone else in this building. I'm no different than anybody else. This is what the Lord has called me to do. He's called you to something else. But if you're faithful in what you're calling, God, God's, God's going to look at you and he's going to say, well done, good and faithful servant. And same as I hope he tells me. I'm not, I don't want power and prestige. I don't want you to, to look at me and think I'm some sort of superhero. I'm not. I'm just a person. But I hope you'll listen to the word. I hope that you'll hear from God. Because that, that is the most important thing. He says, you know, you, you, you think that you're, you're these, these, this guide to the blind. You light those that are in the darkness, instructor of the foolish, teacher of babes. You know, it sounds like, you know, this, I, you know, all these sort of things you might do for a superhero or something like that, right? And he's saying, but when you, when, you, when you tell a man not to steal, do you steal? Do you tell him not to commit adultery? Do you commit adultery? And you're going, but... Well, I didn't steal. Well, are you, are you putting your money where God tells you to put your money? I didn't commit adultery. Are you looking at movies and pictures on TV or on the computer or something you shouldn't be looking at? And ladies, you're not any in more innocent either. You go to the beach and you go look at the, wow, he looks hot. <laughs> Sorry. You know, it, it's the same thing. He says, you abhor idols, do you rob temples? You remember, we, we talked a couple of weeks ago, we talked about, about stewardship. Remember, there was three T's. It wasn't just money, it wasn't just treasure, it's time, talent, and treasure. Are you robbing God? Well, I give my offering. Remember, that's the easy part. Writing a check, that's easy. Do you give your time and your talent? God has given you a spiritual gifting if you are a person of, of faith in here today. Do you use it for the furtherance of the kingdom? Do you use it to build up your brothers and sisters? 
You might be going, I don't know what it is. Then, then please let me know so we can work on it together. We can find out what your spiritual gifting is so you can find where you need to be. Because when we all work together, then, then this job was easy. When you have everybody working together, you know, <laughs> Veronica is going to kill me. <laughs> She's going to kill me. I'm sorry. And so she, you, can, you can tell her and she'll, she'll, she'll give me a tongue lashing later. I keep telling Veronica, you know, we, we, you know, we're trying to get things cleaned up. I said, if we all work as a team, it's going to go easier. We're going to get this done. And she doesn't, she doesn't like working in a group together. They, you know, but the kids, they're going to call. You know, it's like, I said, let's do it. And so she got frustrated with me, and she said, fine, let's do it. And we were, and it works. <laughs> it works. Now, what, what's awesome, though, is, is yesterday, you know, Gracie decided that she wanted to clean up our mudroom. And she worked really hard, and, and Mudroom looks amazing right now. <laughs> it's, it's really cool. Her and, and, and Veronica worked really hard, and they were doing stuff. And, and so it, it's just like, wow, it's like, this is awesome. I might sit in here when it's nice and, you know, open the windows up and just sit in here. <laughs> it's nice. You know, but that's the thing. When we, when we work together as brothers and sisters in Christ, the work is easy. We can accomplish so much together. But if, we're, if you're just going to depend on a few people and you're going to say, well, that's not my job, that's their job. It's hard. Do you realize the burden that, that just a very few people carry even in this church? Have you ever thought about helping lighten the load? But he's, he's telling them all this, this last little bit here, this last verse, it says, verse 24, says, For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you, as is written. He's saying, because you guys like to judge, you like to say, oh, we've got it all figured out, and then you do the exact same things. They're going, look at these people. Isn't that what the world likes to do to, to Christians today? They like to find the people that... that say they're Christians but don't do the Christian walk the Christian life. They like to find the mega church pastors who have, you know, the fleet of cars and the airplanes and all this sort of stuff. You know, here here's the thing. They they're they're saying, oh, you know, what it's for the ministry, it's this, that, whatever. It's like they don't realize the testimony that they're they're giving. If they truly are of God, that they're, they're it's like, do you realize what it looks like when people look at you? Verse 25. For circumcision is indeed profitable if you keep the law. But if you are a breaker of the law, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. Therefore, if an uncircumcised man keeps the righteous requirements of the law, will not his uncircumcision be counted as circumcision? And will not the physical un physically uncircumcised, if he fulfills the law, judge you whom even with your written code and circumcision are a transgressor of the law? For he is not, he is not a Jew... Uh, who is outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward of the flesh, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart and the spirit, not in the letter who, uh, whose praise is not from men, but from God. So what is this talking about here? What, what are we, we, it's talking about, you know, circumcision, you know, that was the thing that the Jews had. They had this mark in the flesh that they said, we're followers of God, we're different than anybody else. And he says, but if you don't follow the law, if you take this mark and say, I'm following of God, but I don't do what God tells me to do, it's as if you didn't even have that. You're taking this mark, you, you know, you're putting the cross on your license plate, you're putting the fish on your car, whatever it is. But if you don't follow the Lord, it, it's, it's of no value to you whatsoever. And he's saying, but in, in those, the, the Gentiles who do the law, aren't they going to sit in judgment over you? Because they're the ones that's doing the law of the Lord, that, that because that their heart is yielded to God, it's as if they are circumcised. Now, he's making this, this, this interesting sort of correlation here. Now, he's, is he talking about Gentiles and circumcision? This is, this is spiritual, okay? Once again, understand this. He's talking about something spiritual, not physical. He's talking to the Jews, so he's talking about the physical things so they understand what's going on. And so I wanted to help un you understand this point. Do you see these two pictures here? This lady here, 
is carrying what's considered to be the world's biggest Bible. You know, you could carry around this Bible. This Bible weighs over 100 pounds. It's huge. I mean, it's bigger than this pulpit when it's opened up. You could carry this around. Look how Christian I am. And you, you just march around with this huge Bible. But if you never open it, you never listen to it, and you never follow anything, what are you? You're a stooge carrying around a big book. This person down here, they're wearing the armor of God, and they're putting it to use. It doesn't matter what, what, what bi- how big of a Bible they have. It doesn't ma- they're putting God's word to use. Remember the shield of faith that they quench the darts of the evil one? See the little fire on the shield there? They're fighting in the storm. You know, when we look at this, we, we, need to, we need to make sure of ourselves. We need to make certain our own slate is clean before you cast stones at others. There's a reason why it says, you know, take the plank out of your own eye before you try to take the speck out. It doesn't say don't take the speck out. That, that's caring for your brother. But make sure you don't have a plank in your own eye first. Because w- if you have a plank in your own eye, you're not going to be able to see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. You know, this is, this is important. This is, this is what this, this chapter is all about, is humility. Understanding that we're sitting in judgment just as much as anyone else. But that's what makes chapter 3 so sweet. So if you're, you're going, man, the, the past two weeks, this has been hard stuff. Yeah, it's been hard. But you know what? What's, what's so awesome is when we see, when, when, when the court case is put in both... Jew and Gentile are sitting at the defense seats and, and, and the judgment is gone. You are guilty. You are guilty because you didn't listen. You're guilty because you had the law and you didn't do it. You're guilty. But when all hope seems lost, and those that know Jesus, you hear the chair squeak as Jesus stands up and he begins to speak. Chapter 3 becomes all that much more sweeter. So I hope that you'll, you'll hang on. I know it's going to be a week delayed, but hang on till we get to chapter 3 because it is going to be amazing. So, as we close out chapter 2, I don't know what, what, where you are in your life. Maybe the, maybe the past two weeks has been really hard, that, that there's no exception. It doesn't matter who you know. It doesn't matter what, what group you're a part of. It doesn't matter what political affiliation you are. It doesn't matter. We're all guilty. There is no exception. And maybe that's that's been hard. Maybe maybe when we we go, you know, and you think, well, I'm better than this person. I'm better than that. No, it doesn't matter. We're all guilty. And so if that's you and you you know that and you haven't asked Jesus to forgive you of your sins. I I know we haven't got to chapter three, but I invite you to experience what chapter three is all about early. And so if the Lord's talking to you today, I ask that you come forward as we have a time of invitation. Maybe the Lord's been talking to you. Maybe, maybe you've been that person who's, who's enjoying watching spiritual Jerry Springer. Jerry, Jerry. <laughs> maybe you'd like to be sitting in judgment of people. Maybe that's, that's been your hobby. And the Lord's telling you this, this, that's not right. And you want to seek, for, you, want, you want to lay that at the foot of the cross, do that. The altar will be open. I'll be up here to pray with you. Maybe, maybe you've been here for a little while and you're going, this, you know, I, I'm not a part of a church, but this is where the Lord wants me. And you want to you wanna do, come up here, we'll make that known. Maybe you want to talk about baptism, whatever the Lord plays, places on your heart. When we have this time of invitation, I hope that you will listen to the Lord and you will, you will come forward and do what the Lord puts on your heart. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for all that you've done for us. Lord, I I am so, so very excited to get to chapter 3. Because, Lord, you're going to take the stand. And we're going to see what you did for us. And, Lord, it is awesome. But, Lord, we needed to have the mirror. We needed to look and see that we are guilty. Because, Lord, it's only when we see how far we have fallen that the mercy of you becomes so, so very sweet. Because when when people think that, oh, I'm a good person, I'm okay. Why do I need salvation? Why do I need forgiven? 
Lord, they, they, they miss it. It's only when a person sees that I am broken and I have done wrong that this, this free gift of salvation when it's offered to us is, is just the coolest drink of water on a hot summer's day. Lord, it, it's, the, it's the breath of fresh air when we've, when we've been in, in staggering heat. Lord, it is, it is the thing that, that gives us hope. And Lord, we thank you for that. Lord, we just pray as, as we go this time of invitation. Lord, if you're speaking to somebody today, Lord, don't let them leave until they've, they've settled things with you, that we have a clean heart and clean conscience before we head home. And Lord, then help us to be the light in this world. Help us to be truthful with people. Tell them that, that, that they need Jesus. But Lord, give them the hope. Because Lord, that's what, that's what you did with Paul. Is you, you helped people see how broken they were, but then you showed them the hope and the truth. What an awesome thing that is. Lord, be with us as we have this time of invitation. We thank you and praise you for it. In your holy name, Lord Jesus. Amen.